what's free fall? We're going to define that. We're going to talk about, talk about projectile motion. By the time we're finished with this section, you will be able to predict where, uh, where a baseball will go based on its initial velocity and the angle that you, the initial speed and the angle that you project it at. Very powerful. You'll be able to drop a rock off of a, as we did once in West Virginia, um, drop a rock off the Westover Bridge, time how long it takes to hit the water, and from that determine how tall the bridge is. Gives you a lot of power. Makes you popular in parties. So I'm going to start off with a demo. And to talk about some physics. Galileo is an Italian physicist who leaned out in the Leaning Tower of Pisa and dropped two masses from, from a window and to demonstrate that the two masses would um, arrive at the ground at the same time. With the argument that the heavier mass, that the force of gravity will be greater on the heavier mass than the, the lighter mass and that that, he, that greater force will overcome the greater mass and that the two would fall with the same acceleration. We can demonstrate that with a ping pong ball and a steel ball here and uh, here in America. The, um, they're, they're both the same size as you can see at in the amount of time that it takes these two to drop to the earth, um, the air friction or air drag is negligible and so they should be able to, if I can release them at the same time, they should um, drop at, at about the same time. So I think you might have been able to hear that uh, the tap of the ping pong ball hitting the floor is about the same time as the thud from the steel ball. Yeah. Let me try it one more time. Yep. So that's Galileo and uh, his masses dropped from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So next I want to do a demonstration with an airfield tube versus an evacuated tube. So with an airfield tube I got a, a heavy thing that turns out to be a dime and then a piece of paper which turns out to be green and the piece of paper, or feather, I can't remember what it is, um, travels more slowly down the tube than in the evacuated tube where we've uh, removed the water, or the air. This is a demonstration that all objects, in the absence of air drag, fall with the same acceleration near the Earth's surface. That acceleration is called the acceleration of gravity, and it has a value of 9.8 meters per second squared. What I have in this tube is a dime and a piece of green paper that when I turn the tube over you can see that the dime makes it down to the bottom before the piece of paper does. But if I evacuate, namely remove the air from this tube, I'm going to try and let you see on the side camera the, um, the pressure of the inside of the tube as I evacuate the tube. The numbers on the outside circle here represent the um, number of inches of mercury with atmospheric pressure being about 29 inches of mercury. 29 is reached right around here. We won't get that far, but Okay, after some pumping action, a little bit of a workout with my hand grip here, 
we've got about um, 24 inches of mercury pressure inside the tube. Compared with, um, actually, I, the gauge pressure is 24 inches of mercury. So essentially, the effective pressure inside here is one atmosphere minus 24 inches of mercury, which is 29 minus 24 is about five inches of mercury. So what I will do, it's not a complete vacuum, but it should be enough to show what we're doing. I'm now gonna close off this valve so that air can no longer pass through this pipe. Remove the pump and then try the experiment again. Same tube, same dime, same piece of paper. So sometimes the piece of paper wins, sometimes the dime wins, but I think you can see that they're both falling at approximately the same rate. And this is essentially the experiment that Galileo did from the Leaning Tower of Pizza, Pisa, where he dropped two balls of different masses. In his case, air drag was negligible. In our case, air drag is is important when there's atmosphere inside the tube, but when you remove that air, then air drag becomes much less important and all obje objects fall at the same rate. So what we have just demonstrated is the fact that in the absence of air drag, all objects near the Earth's surface fall at the same rate. Um, Galileo used a large steel ball and small steel ball, or iron, I'm not sure. They both fell at the same rate. In the evacuated tube experiment, we used a, a dime and a piece of paper. In the absence of air drag, they, uh, they both fell at the same rate. And this is the concept that captures that. We're going to define free fall. What does it mean? We're going to give the magnitude, direction, and components of the constant gravitational acceleration as... Um, when an object travels distances that are smaller than the radius of the Earth. You run into trouble with a constant gravitational acceleration approximation when you're traveling large distances across the surface of the Earth. But for throwing a baseball or a football, all those distances you throw those uh, balls are going to be small compared to the um, radius of the Earth. Free fall is any motion of an object where gravity is the only force acting on it. Gravity is the only force. That's what we mean by free fall. Um, so when you are, are swinging on a swing, uh, you get to the top point, you let go of the chains, you get off the seat, and you fly through the air, are you in free fall? Yes. The reason? The only force acting on you is gravity. When you're in the space shuttle and, or in the vomit comet and you're not touching any of the walls of the space shuttle and you're orbiting around the Earth, the only force acting on you is gravity. You're in free fall. When an object travels distances that are much smaller than the radius of the Earth, like we talked about before, the acceleration of the freely falling object is down toward the center of the Earth and its magnitude, like we said in the video, is nine, approximately 9.8 meters per second squared. That value differs slightly at different points al along the Earth's surface. And as we'll talk about later, as you get far from the Earth, further and further, uh, two or three Earth diameters, that value drops as you get further and further away from the Earth. The Earth's gravity gets weaker. Uh, but right here near the surface of the Earth, um, 9.8 meters per second, the, the letter G, lowercase g, is used to denote the gravitational acceleration. And it is an acceleration. This is the acceleration of the object near the surface of the Earth. It's equal to G. 
and its value has a, it's, it has a magnitude of 9.8 meters per second squared, and it's pointed downward. Another way to write the magnitude is to write a g without the vector over it and write it in italics and not in boldface. And uh, that is the magnitude of the gravitational acceleration. So what are the components of the acceleration? It depends on what coordinate system you choose. The conventional coordinate system is with x being horizontal and y being vertical, upward. And in that case, the acceleration, if, if this is the upward direction and the acceleration is downward, shown in this green arrow here, then this, so now forget about the fact that this is an acceleration and just think about it as a vector. Here's a vector. Here's the x-axis. Here's the y-axis. <clears throat> Does this vector have a component in the x direction? Well, you say, well, no, it doesn't because it's it not, no portion of it is pointing in the, in the x or the minus x direction. So its component in the x direction is zero. Does, the, does this vector have a component in the y direction? Well, yeah, it does. <coughs> Here's the positive y. It's pointing in the negative y, so it should have a negative component in the y direction. And in fact, it's minus 9.8 meters per second squared. So these are the components of the acceleration vector. But I want you to please never forget that this is a vector. And it's a vector that points. The, the only thing you really need to know is that this is a vector that points toward the center of the Earth. And then you can resolve that vector in, into whatever coordinate system you choose. <coughs> so a clicker question. A ball is launched with an up initial velocity v naught as shown. Which one of the following arrows best represents the direction of the acceleration at point A? So we're going to throw this ball um, from this initial spot. Then the ball leaves our hand, and it's now freely falling. The only force acting on it is gravity. And let's say this is horizontal, <coughs> and this is the vertical direction. It's upward. What's the direction of the acceleration at point A? Well, um, it's got to be down. It's um, the acceleration vector is always down. It's going to be down here. It's going to be down here. And it's going to be down here. The acceleration will be the same at every point in this trajectory. How do you know that? You know it because the velocity vector, here's the velocity vector at this point. <coughs> it's getting more and more horizontal. It's getting tilted downward by this downward acceleration. And so, and then eventually it approaches this point here where the velocity is horizontal. And then down here, it's again, the acceleration vector gravity is pulling on this velocity vector, trying to tip it downward. Then by the time we get to here, <coughs> the velocity is in this direction. So which of these is true? Um, the acceleration is going to be downward. Ball is launched with an initial velocity v naught as shown. Which one of the following arrows best represents the direction of the velocity at point B? Okay. And we're interested in not the acceleration this time, but the velocity. We know about the acceleration. The acceleration is down. But the velocity is in the direction of motion at that point. What's the direction of the velocity when it reaches this point? It's always going to be tangent to that curve. So the velocity is going to be horizontal. And this is another misconception. The velocity at point B must be 0 meters per second. That can't possibly be true. Why? If the velocity were 0 up here, 
and you released it from rest, what would it do? It'd head straight down. It wouldn't keep going around this way. Now, the vertical component of the velocity, Vy, right here, is zero. Because this velocity vector has a component only in the x direction. It doesn't have a component in the y direction. So there is something that is zero up there. Falling stone. Stone is uh, dropped from rest from the top of a tall building. Happy day. After three seconds, how far has it fallen and how fast is it moving? Well, we're going to use devs on this. Um, we need a diagram. We've got one. We need a coordinate system. Let's choose one with the origin of coordinates right where the initial position of the ball is. We need two events. Well, we need to define the events. Let's say this is our initial event where we release that stone from rest, and this is our final. Variables. What do we have for variables? We've actually written down what uh, most of what we already know. There is one thing that we, we do need, and that's the acceleration. If this is my x direction and this is my y direction, I know that the acceleration is going to be down, and its value is going to be g. So the acceleration in the x direction is going to be 0. The acceleration in the y direction is going to be a negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So now we're ready to rock and roll. Let's try the y equation. Why not? Well, the initial value of y. Here's my y-axis. Here's the origin of coordinates. Here's my initial position. That initial position is at the origin of coordinates. So y not equals 0. v not y. That's the initial velocity in the y direction. Well, we know it's zero already. We're releasing it from rest. So at the instant that I release it, it's not moving. Then it starts to move right after that. So that'll be zero times t. That'll give me zero. Plus 1 half a y. <clears throat> well, I know what that is. I wrote it down. It's negative 9.8 meters per second squared times t squared. And we know that t is 3 seconds. All right. Well, what does that give me for y? <clears throat> 3 times 3 is 9. And 9.8 is about 10. Let's just get a rough number here. 10 divided by 2 is about 5. 5 times 9 is 45. And there's a minus sign here. So that's approximately negative 45 meters. You say, well, Dr. Edwards, that net and the minus sign makes me uncomfortable. And I say, don't be uncomfortable. <clears throat> Take a look at what's happening here. This represents the final value of y. It's down here. Is y negative or positive down here? Well, y is positive up here. Y is 0 here, so my y had to be negative down there. So we don't have to feel too bad about that. It goes about 45 meters, and that minus sign tells me that it's down below the origin of coordinates. So it's fallen about 45 meters. Let's see how fast it's moving. Now, 
v naught, the y component of v naught is zero. The acceleration in the y direction, well, we know what that is. That's nine, minus 9.8 meters per second squared. The time is three seconds. Nine point eight is about let's just call it ten. Should make our numbers easier. Uh, you can plug it in your calculator if you want. Times three is about thirty. Let's check the units. This second in the numerator kills one of these seconds in the denominator. So we'll end up with meters per second when we're done. So it's moving. It's fallen about 45 meters, and it's moving at about 30 meters per second. What does this minus sign tell you about the velocity? Which means it's moving down, not up. A referee to tosses a coin up with an initial speed of 5 meters per second. How high does the coin go above its point of release? This is a great problem. Here's my initial event. Here's my final event. Here's my coordinate system with y and x here. Um, let's look first at the vy equation. <coughs> the final value of the velocity. Here's the final point. What's its velocity? Zero. The initial value of the velocity and its component in the y direction. Here's my initial velocity. Here's my y-axis. They're parallel to each other. This velocity is pointing in the positive y direction. So that initial velocity is going to be positive 5 meters per second. Acceleration in the y direction. We've got y up. What direction is acceleration? Down. The y component of acceleration will be negative 9.8, just like the last problem. Times t. Well, we don't know what that is. But luckily, we can solve for it here. Um, this is about negative 10 times t. If we add that to both sides, we'll get 10t on the left side of the equation. And then we divide both sides by 10. So this is about 10t. 9.8 is about 10. 10, let's see, 10 meters per second squared times t equals 5 meters per second. Let's solve for t is 5 meters per second divided by 10 meters per second squared, and that's one half a second approximately. That's approximate. And so it's in the, it's traveling upward for half a second. And I've taken into account the fact that the final velocity is zero. That's what's allowed me to calculate the time. And so we want to know how high it goes so we can use this equation. Why not? If this is my origin of coordinates, and this is where the initial position of that coin is, then its initial value of y is 0, because it's sitting at the origin of coordinates initially. Plus v not y. We already worked that out. It's 5 meters per second. And now we know the time. It's one half second, approximately. Plus one half 
a y, let me just put it in as 10, it's minus 9.8, but minus 10 meters per second squared. You can work the numbers out more accurately if you want. One half second quantity squared. What do we get? Well, I get 10 times a half is 5. And then we've got another half here. So this, this gives me 5 halves. This term here gives me 5 halves meter. And this term gives me it's 10 divided by 2 is 5. And divided by 1 half, or divided by 2 squared, so 5 divided by 4. And that is 5 halves minus 5 fourths. That's the same as 10 halves. And 5 halves minus 10 halves is a minus 5 halves meters. Oh no, sorry. Um, this, I did, the, did that wrong. I need to get a common denominator here. And to get a common denominator, I've got a 4 here, and I need a 4 here. So I multiply the numerator and the denominator of this first term by 2. So this gives 5 times 2 is 10, divided by 2 times 2 is 4. 10 fourths minus 5 fourths gives me 5 fourths. So that's the height that it goes, so just a little over one meter to get up there. And you can plug the numbers in and uh, use 9.8 to get it more accurate. All right, another demo. This is a demonstration of the acceleration of gravity on a ball that I'm going to throw straight up, just like that. While it's in the air, during the first leg of its journey, it's going up. So here's the ball when I release it. Uh, its velocity vector is headed in the vertical direction. The velocity decreases. Uh, as it's rising, it slows down because gravity is slowing it down, pulling it in the direction opposite its motion. When it reaches the top, its velocity is zero. It's momentarily at rest. And then gravity starts pulling it down. And now gravity is acting in the direction of the velocity. Here's the velocity vector in black. And gravity is pulling it down. In green are shown the gravitational acceleration vectors. And these are always down. So the gravity is acting down while it's on its way up. The gravity is acting down while it's on its way down. And the gravity is also acting down when it's at the top, when its velocity is zero. Were it not so, if, there, if the gravity didn't act on it when it's at the top, it would get up to the top and stay there forever. So that's how you know that even though the velocity vanishes, is zero at the top, Gravity still must be acting because the velocity vector is changing. It's going from up to down. So now, when you tell your grandkids about what happens to a ball, you'll tell them that at the peak of its uh, vertical journey, its velocity is zero, but its acceleration is still 9.8 meters per second squared pointing down. OK. A child throws a ball vertically. This is the example we just basically looked at. Um, upward of the school playground, which one of the following quantities is or are equal to zero at the highest point of the ball's trajectory? Um, this is definitely zero at the top. The velocity is zero. The acceleration is not zero. It's negative 9.8. Point it, well, its acceleration is down. Always down. Uh, the average acceleration is not zero. 
And so the only thing that's zero at the top there, just as we talked about in the video, is the instantaneous acceleration. Were it not so, that ball would stay up there forever. It wouldn't come back down again. The ball is thrown vertically. Uh, the ball rises to the maximum height, falls back to the surface. Which one of the following statements concerning the situation is true if air resistance is neglected? Um, acceleration never points upward. That's not right. The ball is freely following body for the duration of its flight. That's certainly true. The acceleration of the ball because freely falling body because the only force acting on it is gravity. The acceleration of the ball is zero when the ball is its highest point. Not true. We talked about that a lot. Velocity and acceleration of the ball always point in the opposite direction. Is that true? Well, as it's going up, the velocity is going up and the acceleration is down. So the, in that case, they're pointing in opposite directions. Uh, well, they're pointing in opposite direction, but they can also be in the same direction. After it reaches the top and it's coming down, the velocity and the acceleration are in the same direction. So that's not true. The velocity and acceleration of the ball always point in the same direction. Not true either. Sometimes they're opposite. All right. Um, so, symmetry. Does the pellet in part B strike the ground beneath the cliff with a smaller or greater or the same speed as the pellet in part A? You can take advantage of symmetry on this problem. If you project this pellet down at 30 meters per second from the edge of the cliff, throw it at 30 meters per second. Um, here you're throwing it up at 30 meters per second, but you can, in the absence of air drag, then this is going to go up, come to rest, turn around, and then by the time it reaches this point, it'll be going 30 meters per second again. So it'll look exactly the same as this uh, second case here, and that's this uh, case here. So. Um, it will, you can throw it up at 30 meters per second and it'll still hit the ground at the same speed that, that it would have had you thrown it down at 30 meters per second. Another demo, one of my favorites. Suppose you're hunting in the forest and you want to hit a monkey, but suppose your monkey is smart and as soon as the bullet leaves the muzzle of your gun, the monkey realizes that the bullet has left the gun and releases his or her grip from the tree branch and falls vertically downward. The cool thing about physics is that you will hit the monkey every time if he does that because as gravity pulls down on the bullet, it pulls down on the monkey and it pulls them, uh, they both accelerate at the same rate in the vertical direction and the horizontal component of velocity of your bullet doesn't matter. So the way it works is this. If this is your bullet and this is your initial velocity vector for the, for the bullet, you have a horizontal component of velocity and a vertical component of velocity. But gravity only affects the uh, vertical component of the velocity. And what it does is it curves what would have been a straight trajectory straight toward the, the monkey into a curved parabolic trajectory. And when it arrives at this point, the, it's easy to work out the theory that the monkey, if he releases his hold on the, on the branch at the same time the bullet is fired, then he'll fall by the same amount that the bullet will fall. So we're going to demonstrate that with a poor, uh, adorable, curious George stuffed monkey. He's got a green laser on his snout. He's attached to a little electromagnet. It's about uh, three inches high. And that magnet is attached via this cord. Uh, the cord runs along the the floor here to this supply. And this is our, our gun. And just because I love little Curious George, we're not going to use a real bullet. We'll use a foam. Um, uh, uh, so he doesn't get damaged in the process. 
This is the green laser that's pointing at, at the monkey's snout. When this foam bullet crosses the muzzle of this gun right here, there's a piece of aluminum foil that will uh, break the circuit. So the ball will actually break the circuit, which sends a signal to the electromagnet over there so that there's no longer current in the electromagnet. The electromagnet releases its hold on poor George and down he falls. So I have a red button here to push and we will see how well this works. Of course with a real gun, the, in that distance there's not going to be much gravitational effect. So we're going to have a, uh, a gun that does have a little bit of a parabolic trajectory to the, the uh, projectile. This is compressed air here. We're sitting at 70 psi and when I push this red button, it will release a puff of air which will send this um, red and orange ball toward our dear monkey. So counting down, three, two, one, zero. And it's a sad day for poor George. Here's an example a fun example. You've got an airplane, it's got a package, it's moving horizontally and it drops uh, a package. And so initially the, the airplane and the package are moving at the same speed in the same direction. So you just imagine you're in the, the cargo bay of the airplane and there's an opening. You just take this package and you release it from rest. So at that instant it's traveling at the same velocity as the plane both at 115 uh, meters per second. Well, the plane has lift on its wings and it continues along horizontally and the package then uh, starts, starts falling. And the question is how fast it's moving when it hits, determine the time for the care package to hit the ground and the magnitude and direction of its final velocity. So one interesting piece of information, and we've, we've uh, hinted at this before, is that the horizontal component of the package when it hits the ground is the same as the horizontal component of the velocity of the package when it leaves the plane, assuming that air drag can be neglected. What changes is the vertical component of velocity of the package. And um, so we're going to try and find the magnitude and direction of its final velocity. Well, we already have the uh, horizontal component. And let's actually verify that that will be the horizontal component. We've taken x, uh, positive x to the right, uh, positive y upward. Let's look at vx. to determine the velocity at time t when it hits the ground compared with the initial velocity up here. Well, in order to do this, we're going to have to come to grips with the acceleration in the x direction. Well, this package is in free fall. So an object in free fall, according to the concept, experiences an acceleration equal to g, which is pointed down. So the acceleration is downward. And it's equal to the gravitational acceleration vector, which has a magnitude of 9.8 meters per second squared. So the x component of this acceleration is 0. And the y component of this acceleration is a negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So over here, ax is 0. That means that the final velocity in the x direction is whatever the initial velocity was up here. Here's my initial. Here's my final. And the initial is 115 meters per second. So what we've done here is just proved that this uh, final velocity in the x direction is um, the same as the initial velocity in the x direction. Now, to find the velocity in the y direction, we actually know the distance 
that it falls. And from the, um, so we're going to need to make peace with the y equation before we can find that vy. We want to incorporate this information. So the y equation says, all right, and we're going to um, need to choose a coordinate system. Choose an origin of coordinates. Where is y equal to 0? The way that um, it's been done in the book, and I'll go ahead and adopt that same way here, is to choose a coordinate system where x, where the origin of coordinates is along the line of travel of the plane. y is 0 here. And then if you go above where the plane is, y is positive. If you go down below where the plane is, y is negative. And so that's why this, this y is a negative 1050 meters. It's because plus y is that way. And down at this point here, we're, we're 1050 me 1,050 meters below uh, the original level of the plane. So the final value of y, the y down here is negative 1050. equals the initial value of y, well, that's just 0, because the package was dropped right from the plane, which is at y equals 0, plus the initial velocity, the initial, this is the initial velocity vector, and this is v not x, the x component um, the, of the initial velocity. But this, this initial velocity vector doesn't have a y component. It's all pointing in the x direction. So v not y equals 0. So that makes our lives happier. This v not y, that just gives me 0. And then we have 1 plus 1 half times a, a y times t squared. The rest of it's easy. 1 half a y is negative 9.8 meters per second squared times t squared. <coughs> All right, so there's a lot of writing on here, but we can see that if we multiply both the left and the right side by a negative sign, then that becomes positive. That becomes positive. And 9.8 divided by 2 is 4.9. And so we can solve for t. It'll be this 1050 meters divided by this number here, which is half of 4.9, a half of 9.8, which is 4.9 meters per second squared. But remembering that this is t squared that we've solved for, to find t, we're going to have to take a square root of both sides. And we can plug that uh, into our calculator and see what we get. 1050 divided by 4.9 and take the square root and we get about 14.6. Let's check the units. The meters will cancel. We have 1 over 1 over second squared which means that the second squared comes into the numerator, and the square root of second squared is seconds. So about 14.6 seconds for that package to leave the plane and drop down to the ground, which makes sense. One, two, three, four seconds. But what we're interested in here is the, the um, well, we found the time, and we're interested in the magnitude and direction of the final velocity. Well, how do we find that? We can now apply to the y equation to find this final component of velocity in the y direction. Well, we know what the initial component of velocity in the y direction is. It's 0. We already talked about that. We know what a y is. It's negative 9.8 
meters per second squared. And we know what t is now. We just found it. It's 14.6 seconds. So this gives us Vy, negative 9.8 times 14.6 is negative 143. So how does that number compare with the x component of velocity? Well, the x component is only 115. This is a little bit bigger in magnitude, 143. The minus sign tells me what? What does that minus sign tell me? Well, the vy is the component of velocity in the y direction, but the y direction is upward according to our choice. The minus sign therefore says that the velocity is, is uh, going in the negative y direction or downward. Now to find v, the magnitude of the velocity, we have a right triangle with this side having uh, it being 115 meters per second, this side being 143 meters per second. We can use the Pythagorean theorem. plus, I ran out of space here, so that's all underneath the square root. That would give you v, and then you could also find the um, direction of the velocity, say this angle theta here, by taking an inverse tangent. So let's see if we can find a space here. Theta will be the inverse tangent. So that angle theta will be the inverse tangent of this leg of the triangle whose magnitude is 143 divided by this leg of the triangle, which is 115. And we could plug those in to find the angle. Uh, another example shoot a bullet in, into the air. So you can see a, a dim view of, of a sports car with a rifle pointing straight up. So, uh, and the question is, you shoot a bullet into the air while you're uh, driving along the sports car, and if you can ignore air resistance, then where does a bullet end up? Um, so let's look at it first from the point of view of the of the rifle person in the car. He's looking straight up, he or she is looking straight up, pointing the gun straight up. So from his perspective, the initial velocity of that bullet is vertical. There's no horizontal component to it. <coughs> so that's the muzzle velocity of the bullet. But then we have to ask the question from a person standing on the side of the road, watching that car pass, that person sees that the car, the rifle person, and the rifle, and the bullet in the rifle are all traveling horizontally as well. So there's going to be a component of velocity in the x direction for the bullet and a component of velocity in, for the bullet in the y direction. This is the muzzle velocity, and this is the car's velocity, because the bullet, the gun, the person, and the car are all traveling at whatever speed the car is traveling at. So the net <coughs> velocity, um, it, we, we calculated in the same way we did the last time, the square root of the sum of the squares, and we can um, then and, and then we can figure out what the trajectory is from the point of view of a person standing on the side of the road. But if we go now back and ask, what does that bullet look like from the perspective of the person sitting in the car? If you ignore air resistance, the bullet from his perspective is going to go straight up, come straight back down and land right, right back on, on, top of the, uh, on top of the gun again. And here's a little demo video to, to demonstrate this. 
This is a demonstration of the independence of motion in the x and the y directions. What I have here is a, is a cart that moves along the track and a ball with a plunger and when I depress the plunger then the ball is released and the, and the plunger activates when this sensor passes a little uh, metallic strip right here. So if the cart isn't moving, then the ball goes straight up and down and comes right back down to where, where it started. If I depress it again and give it a little bit of momentum, then what happens is the ball looks like, from your perspective and mine, the ball looks like it's executing a parabolic trajectory. From the point of view of the cart, though, an observer sitting in this cart, the ball will go straight up and come straight back down on top of his head. So that, that shows independence of motion in the x and the y directions and um, that's it. <laughs>